Mm, I am Marina Romanets, and uh, I am the author of uh, Ukrainian erotomaniac fiction's first Portland Post independence wave, which deals with uh, sexually explicit representations in contemporary Ukrainian literature. And uh, I am focusing on the first decade after Ukrainian independence. So I am looking at the political transgressive energies of the erotic in the Ukrainian uh, situation. I was born uh, and uh, raised uh, and uh, educated in the USSR. So the country which was uh, um, just the country of uh, uh, practically total repression of any freedoms and the repression of the body was among them because the Soviet society was uh, uh, profoundly sexophobic. And uh, even during Gorbachev's perestroika and uh, at one of the first TV bridges between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, there was a question from the American audience and how about sexuality and how about sex. Uh, to which there was an answer, there is no sex in the USSR. So this formula of the complete absence of sexuality and uh, sexless bodies, uh, which congregated across uh, Soviet literature, um, somehow was ruined by um, different kind of democratic processes in Ukrainian society, starting with perestroika and uh, then uh, later on after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was really uh, impressed by the appearance of an uh, um, overwhelming amount of uh, sexually explicit imagery. And uh, it was uh, um, just propagating in different cultural forms. So you practically saw it everywhere. And uh, um, I had more serious um, scholarly interests before that. But then I read, uh, um, it seems to me it was Pokolchuk's uh, um, collection of short stories called uh, What Lies Beneath. Uh, uh, I was really uh, surprised by the attention that he was paying to female images which uh, or characters who were like sexually insatiable and uh, who never had enough sex. Um, it was a little bit disturbing for me and I decided to present a paper on uh, this kind of literature at uh, um, Canadian Association of Slavist uh, Conference. Uh, it was a success. One of the grand uh, um, men of uh, Canadian-Ukrainian scholarship said that it was a very penetrating presentation. And uh, I was talking probably like for the most uh, of my presentation about different kinds of sexual postures represented by the um, artist and uh, pr uh, penetration. So it was a kind of ironic and uh, it was a sign that I should do it. Definitely there had to be new vocabulary to um, just express and represent the body, bodily desires and uh, erotic energies and whatever was going on. On, uh, between two people in a close intimate contact. This vocabulary was practically absent uh, from uh, current and especially from Ukrainian literature during the Soviet period. And uh, that is why that was the project of uh, invention of a new language, how to speak about the body. And uh, um, it was an amazing process because uh, every writer was coming up with their own additions to the taxonomies and vocabularies and so on and so forth. So the language had to be forged. And uh, many of the writers were just very actively engaged in the creation of this language. 
and uh, uh, well, uh, Pokalchuk, who is one of the authors that I am looking at in my book, um, he was practically saying that he would like to uh, establish Ukrainian pornographic tradition, uh, so that it is uh, um, that um, it fills in the gap. Uh, in Ukrainian literary process uh, in general, and uh, um, that is why he saw it as a revitalization of Ukrainian language, language which was very thoroughly marginalized, uh, uh, forbidden in the uh, during the uh, Russian Empire, in the Russian Empire, and uh, then uh, profoundly marginalized uh, in the Russo-Soviet Empire. Yeah, there was a lot of slang, and it depends upon the writer, right, who is doing that. Uh, for Pokalchuk, it was a kind of a recovery of vocabulary that already existed, right? There were words, um, well, and uh, uh, um, when I'm talking about Vinnychuk, who is writing Zhitiya Haremnoye, Life in the Harem, which is uh, um, just a stylization of the 16th century um, Ukrainian language, because he is forging uh, the diary of Roxolana, who was uh, the wife of uh, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. So he had uh, to uh, somehow follow the rules to uh, preserve this sounding of the 16th century language. It's accessible to contemporary reader, but at the same time you have a feeling that this is something different. That is why uh, his uh, um, just representation and description of sexual scenes, uh, uh, they are more flowery, so to say, and uh, more metaphoric and uh, uh, following probably um, just the style of the erotic manuals of the period, uh, such as uh, uh, Bahname, which was uh, uh, just a Turkish erotic ma manual, or the perfumed garden, uh, garden from Persia, or Kama Sutra, Indian Kama Sutra. So it depended. Uh, when I'm looking at uh, Valery Shevchuk, who is very much a Baroque person, um, he is again engaged uh, in the stylization of the language, but at the same time he is doing it when uh, uh, Vinnychuk is playing with it, and uh, when he is creating this um, just very uh, playful pastiche, um, Valery Shevchuk is approaching his material very seriously because he has been a translator of uh, uh, Ukrainian literature of the period from uh, Middle Ukrainian language into contemporary Ukrainian language. That is why his stylization uh, is more authentic, so to say, or at least it looks like more belonging to the period, can, uh, just comparing to what Vinnychuk does. Uh, but he is again very much into uh, just metaphors. Um, well, the moment of ejaculation is a, a blast of something, lava, a volcano, and so on and so forth. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Podervyansky, um, he is uh, very much into Surzhik, and uh, he is very much into substandard language as well. So he combines in his work uh, just very lofty literary Ukrainian, and at the same time, this uh, absolutely um, incomprehensible um, just stratum of the language which was uh, uh, brought by the Russian Empire, which is Mat, and uh, uh, the contact language of Ukrainian and uh, Russian, which has been uh, like very illustrative for. Uh, the majority of Ukrainian situation, which is a uh, surge that somehow represents the essence of the condition of Homo Sabaticus in the best possible way. So you can see many words uh, uh, which you don't really come across in uh, what uh, people conventionally think about as uh, literature. Well, Oksana Zabushko. 
um, I open my book with her field research in Ukrainian sex, which is Polyvidus Yidzhenia Zukrainskoa Sexu. Uh, the book, which really produced a blast because uh, uh, it became uh, the first national bestseller, uh, she was making her name as a poet, but with the publication of field research, she became uh, really famous. And, uh, um, well, she attracted much of really attention. The uh, responses were very positive and very negative, but she definitely became uh, a very important figure in the uh, post-independent uh, uh, literary, independence literary situation, Ukrainian literary situation. And uh, um, I'm looking at her work because uh, she was the first or she is the first woman writer in Ukrainian literature who was very openly uh, writing about the desires, frustration, anxieties of female body. And she was practically and she still is giving voice to those people who didn't know how to talk about exper their experiences. And particularly to talk about their experiences in the Ukrainian language. So the language becomes a, a very significant issue there. And uh, it's a very complicated text because it has many layers. And if you think about it, it's not about sex. I'm not going to characterize everybody, but I'll go through the list. Uh, the next one is Yurko Pakalchuk. And uh, he is uh, um, just, uh, um, he, he already died, unfortunately, and uh, um, he was a well-known writer. Uh, he is a literary scholar, the scholar of Latin American literature. He is a translator, and uh, um, he is the one who very clearly defined uh, his agenda in writing about sexuality, that he would like to establish a uh, pornographic tradition that Ukrainian literature was uh, uh, just lacking. So uh, he has been uh, working with the Western, um, just Western uh, pornographic, so to say, narratives. But at the same time, uh, he, uh, he was positioning them, uh, them in the realities of uh, cultural um, social, economic situation in Ukraine. So he addressed in many of his stories, he was addressing just people who were coming from disprivileged backgrounds and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, many critics consider him to be um, just a kind of a, uh, a writer who is producing kitsch. Um, I'm thinking about him as somebody who was practically transgressing um, the established taboos and uh, working in the content zone between socialist realism, uh, transitional zo uh, zone between socialist realism, which was the only acceptable method in the USSR, and something new, introducing the transgression of tradition, transgression of language, transgression of subject matter, and different kinds of, of social transgressions of his character. Characters. Then Vinnychuk, whom I have already mentioned, uh, and his life in the harem, Zhidiye uh, Haremnoye, where, and uh, mm, he is a mystificator, and this is one of his mystifications. And uh, the other one was published during the Soviet Union in the 1980s. He decided that uh, he would publish his translation of uh, uh, Irish poem, which was written about um, um, Chinghis Khan's uh, um, raid of Kiev. Uh, and, uh, um, well, uh, um, it was published in Literatura uh, Ukraina, Literary Ukraine. The name of the Irish, of the imaginary Irish monk was Rian Habar. 
so it was published in uh, Literary Ukraine, which was a central literary um, paper. Uh, at that time, uh, then uh, in uh, reputable uh, journals, and la then later on, uh, um, just literary scholars started to analyze it. And then uh, it made uh, its way into Ukrainian literary encyclopedia uh, and uh, in the article on Irish literature. So he was very good at deception. When he started uh, to publish Roxolana's diary, uh, patriotically oriented public was absolutely disgusted. Our glorious Roxolana could never do that. Uh, all she was doing in the Turkish harem was to enlighten the Sultan about Ukraine and uh, to promote Ukrainian uh, needs and uh, interests and so on and so forth. Then uh, he demystified himself and, uh, well, uh, people uh, were aware of the fact that um, he is the author, that it is not Roxolana's uh, memoir, memoir, but at the same time he created a very plausible story how it was found, uh, how it made its way from uh, Turkey to Ukraine. He engaged uh, uh, just real uh, historical people, right, the Hatton Hell Krimsky and so on and so forth. So it was a very interesting project that I uh, decided to explore and uh, it was really fun. Uh, the next one is Valery Shevchuk. I have already mentioned him as uh, um, just somebody who has been working for a lengthy period of time with the Baroque material, which was during the Soviet uh, period as a kind of a descent itself, because Baroque was uh, uh, just uh, um, that um, historic moment and cultural moment uh, of Ukraine, which didn't make it into official Ukrainian history, so it was practically erased uh, and uh, suppressed. Uh, and uh, Shevchuk, by excavating it, uh, really did an important work. Uh, he is the only one who has established, uh, uh, just well established literary reputation. And uh, by the time he decided to switch into uh, eroticism, uh, um, he was already the winner of the Shevchenko Literary Prize, which is the highest uh, literary prize in Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, just a very reputable author. Uh, he continued to write uh, um, into the Baroque setting, but um, his uh, uh, ideas of sexuality are very much ahistorical because if he is writing about contemporary Ukraine, it's the same, uh, uh, just the same uh, blasts, the same volcanoes, the same uh, um, just hell as it used to be in the Baroque setting as well. So the next one uh, is uh, a new uh, twist in Ukrainian popular literature, which is represented by twin brothers, the Kaprano brothers, and uh, um, their Kobzar 2000. Uh, there they um, enter into a dialogue with Shevchenko's Kobzar, but what they are doing, they are adjusting Ukrainian classics, which played uh, an unprecedented role for the development of Ukrainian culture uh, since the 19th century, and uh, make it more sexy. So there is sexuality, there are vampires, there are succubi, there are uh, just werewolves, and so on and so forth. Well, there was a pornography debate in Ukrainian uh, parliament in 1990s, the so-called pornography uh, debate, because uh, uh, they were debating the introduction of the law on uh, morality and uh, where they were uh, defining pornography and uh, eroticism. Uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, just under discussion in the parliament for several years, and then it was suddenly, well, it was uh, uh, just finally adopted. Uh, during this particular period, 
one of the uh, parliamentary members and uh, leading journalists and political analysts in Ukraine, Mykola Tomenko. Uh, he even wrote a book which was called uh, Teoria Ukrainskoho Kochania, The Theory of Ukrainian Love. And uh, he was stating in this book that Ukrainians, they are not into like this dirty, um, erotic stuff or, or sexuality or whatever. Ukrainians are a spiritual nation. Anything of this kind uh, is uh, like very alien to Ukrainian national ethos. So it's a corrupting influence either from the East or from the West, but Ukrainians are not that way. Well, so part of the Ukrainian intellectuals and particularly during that period of time, they were like very uh, up buttoned and uh, they didn't or buttoned up and uh, they didn't talk about it and uh, they considered it to be quite an inappropriate um, subject matter. Well, but uh, people were trying, the writers that I'm looking at, uh, they have been trying somehow to um, just uh, make the way for this. I'm not saying that this is pornography per se, as we understand it. According to the rule, uh, just go, um, there is uh, uh, one partner, another partner, there is a threesome, uh, there is a group uh, sex, and uh, let's describe how it happens. Uh, I rather apply uh, just the term erotomanic fictions, fictions which are about eroticism and uh, which demonstrate some compulsion in representations of sex, but at the same time they have their plots, the writers are not uh, just working with bare uh, pornographic material. It's more about uh, what was published online in different kinds of uh, website libraries where it's, it's really the pornographic formula, but I'm not looking at that. Uh, in the book specifically, I have uh, uh, a section in my introduction which addresses this particular part of uh, Ukrainian uh, cultural scene of that time. Um, so many of them uh, are quite um, uneasy with the representation of the body. And uh, since I'm talking about, um, uh, Oksana Zabushka is the only writer, uh, woman writer whom I have included because that's how the scene was represented. Um, a literary scene was represented because it was mainly male literary scene. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, there was the subject matter that was still limiting the choice of the authors. Um, so she very frankly was looking into um, the effects of uh, um, just Soviet rule on uh, people's bodies and people's minds. And uh, um, she is uh, um, talking about this trauma, trauma that affects people in every possible way, including the way where they are supposed to most spontaneously and uh, freely express their desire in their beds and their interactions with their partners. And uh, uh, she is very much focused on uh, uh, just this debilitating uh, heritage of the empire as far as male character, just uh, the partner of the protagonist is concerned. Well, that was really uh, not well taken by male uh, authors and uh, Pokalchuk, whom I have already mentioned, uh, um, he was saying, oh, uh, male sexuality, there is nothing wrong with Ukrainian male sexuality. Well, female sexuality might be uh, just influenced by religion or by uh, just totalitarian rule. And uh, in this particular area, he is uh, like very essential uh, or essentialist, representing essentialist attitude to um, just male identity. And at the same time, he is uh, um, uh, just accepting constructivist attitude uh, of female sexuality, which is influenced by different cultural, uh, political and uh, social factors. 
Uh, well, with the Kapranov brothers, um, there is this distinct uh, um, uh, just mark of uh, their, although they are talking about sex, but they are sexophobic. They are very uncomfortable with their bodies. Their male characters are predominantly uh, voyeurists, and uh, it's women who are drawing them uh, into sexual relationships. What is interesting, they divide their book, which is Kabzar, which is referring to the so-called like national the book in Ukrainian uh, just literary and cultural tradition in general. Uh, and uh, they divide the book into two parts. One is Kabzar Soft, which is for women. And uh, the other one is Kobzar Had, which is for men. And uh, they are describing and uh, they are appearing to their readers with this particular paradigm where a woman is all for love and emotion and so and talking and feelings, while man is a warrior, man is uh, just strong-willed, man is intellectual, man is solving problems and so on and so forth. What I found quite interesting in this situation that they are practically relating the book which was quite popular uh, in the West and uh, which was uh, written by a marriage counselor uh, in the United States. Uh, women are from uh, Venus or men are from Mars, women are from Venus or vice versa. Uh, well, uh, so they have uh, um, they have used uh, sexuality, but in a very limited, in a very confined, uh, and I would say even crippled manner. And uh, uh, there is only one story which is about um, an insatiable woman who is uh, a succubus. And uh, yeah, they are uh, just drawing on folklore. And uh, there is this distinct touch of the folkloresque, which has become quite popular in uh, uh, contemporary culture, not only in Ukraine, but uh, just internationally. Uh, well, I briefly referred to Les Podervyansky, and uh, he uses the language which has been a substandard language in the Soviet society. So you are going to encounter quite a lot of uh, uh, just four letter words, uh, and uh, uh, he is populating his uh, plays with different uh, characters. They are from Soviet literary canon, they are from Soviet art, they are from from uh, uh, just Greek mythology, they are from anywhere, draws on different kinds, of, uh, just creating this absolutely absurd bricolage of uh, uh, what is going on, uh, which is uh, uh, a violent scene, a scene of uh, different kinds of uh, uh, just cruelties that are inflicted on uh, uh, characters who are um, just fornicating with each other on uh, in every scene and so on and so forth. So this is uh, the language which uh, has been uh, in use, but which has been uh, never brought on scene uh, and uh, was practically never visible in uh, uh, just printed culture. The Bushka's novel, and especially in uh, um, just uh, an authorized or pre-publication of her novel, that she was practically writing, uh, just producing a li life writing um, piece in uh, transforming reality into fiction. So it draws somehow on her relation, uh, on her personal relationship. Uh, Pokolchuk himself, he was giving uh, numerous interviews because uh, he was scandalously, scandalously popular. I'm surprised that um, he is out of the picture uh, right now on the contemporary literary scene, almost out of the picture. And uh, he was boasting that everything that he is uh, just writing about is from his personal experience. Uh, which I take uh, quite skeptically because uh, um, he knows too much about pornography and uh, some of the things that he is uh, 
presenting in his stories, uh, which he ambitiously uh, published as uh, an 800-page long um, book uh, under the title Kama Sutra. Uh, well, Ukrainian philosophy of sexuality and uh, life. Uh, well, there are some uh, scenes that I doubt very much that he experienced personally himself. When I started working on uh, um, this particular topic, I was uh, just intrigued uh, by uh, the subject matter, which was uh, not permissible in the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, then I started looking at this kind of literature. Uh, I was surprised by the fact that uh, it started to proliferate right after um, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was during the period when different kinds of repression uh, were counted. And uh, the repression of the body is one of them. And uh, this is an important part of uh, not only body politics uh, in society, but uh, identity politics in general and ideology, uh, like not only personal identities, but national identities as well. Um, well, what I found uh, that I didn't know, I, as far as uh, explicitly uh, explicit representations of erotomaniac literature is concerned. Uh, there was not much published in Ukraine about it. And uh, I uh, just was familiarizing myself with uh, uh, just the scene, uh, international scene as well. So I was working with uh, Western uh, sources. Uh, about pornography, about eroticism, about um, like different kinds of theoretical approaches, about the methodology people are dealing with. Uh, um, so that was uh, eye-opening because uh, before that I was in a strictly political post-colonial field uh, and uh, my first book was about um, just uh, improvised traditions in contemporary Ukrainian literature, uh, which was ambitiously called uh, anamorphosic texts and reconfigured visions. Well, now I wouldn't do that, but that was back when, back when. Uh, so it was uh, a shift, uh, which was exciting. Then there was a success because uh, I got, uh, for this particular project, I got uh, just a short grant, which is a very important uh, just research grant from uh, um, social um, sciences and humanities research council of Canada. Um, so that gave me the possibility to not only to conduct research in different places, but go to conferences. So personal uh, just contacts with people who were working in uh, approximately the same area were very important as well. And uh, I learned uh, uh, quite a lot from uh, um, conferencing and uh, then uh, just following what was happening at conferences. Uh, yes, there were things uh, I didn't know. Well, there was definitely a vocabulary that I have uh, um, just acquired in the process. And uh, it was funny because uh, I uh, did uh, um, just a uh, joint project with a Ukrainian scholar who is a woman as well. And uh, we were talking about sexuality, but she was talking more about mapping. And uh, when he, she had to pronounce the word pedophilia, she was very um, uneasy and uncomfortable in saying that. Uh, it was a long time ago, but at the same time, uh, um, yes, people, people somehow expand um, their vocabularies, their knowledge, and uh, this is what was happening with me. And uh, uh, probably um, the uh, rewarding part of my project is uh, that um, I married uh, the issue of uh, um, explicit sexual representations uh, and uh, politics.
Well, Ukrainian women should know everything about themselves. And uh, there is no limit in exploration of uh, different kinds of subject matter. And uh, in my uh, post scriptum to the book, I am talking about um, four women writers um, who are already writing in a new millennium. Uh, two of them uh, is uh, uh, two of them are uh, just established writers before that who decided to switch to um, this uh, tabooed, so to say, subject matter. And among them, uh, it's Maria Matios. Uh, who was the winner um, by uh, of Shevchenko Literary Prize by the time uh, uh, when uh, uh, she uh, published her pulp fiction, Bulvarny Roman, um, in uh, the first decade uh, of the new millennium, and uh, which she claims to be um, just a political pornography. Uh, well, uh, and uh, uh, Evgenia Kononenko, who, who was an established uh, writer by the time uh, that she published her uh, uh, Street Walkers uh, Get Married to, Zamish, which is a collection of short stories. Uh, so they are trying themselves uh, in this particular genre. And uh, I am talking and I am calling this particular feminized way, porno -shik. Uh, Ukrainian style because uh, there was the invasion of the erotic space in literature by women writers in uh, uh, Western cultures, which was happening in the uh, 1980s and especially in 1990s. So I am thinking that this is the process which is shared by Ukrainian women too. And then I'm looking at two absolutely young and uh, uh, insanely um, talented um, women, Sofia Andruhovich and her novel uh, Sionka, Salmon, and uh, um, um, Irena Karpa, Perlomitrova Porno, Necrarious Porn. And uh, uh, they demonstrate an absolutely different sensibility and different understanding of themselves uh, and uh, their bodies. They are uninhibited and uh, they are writing about their own uh, experiences. And this is something good because it's uh, uh, just allowing women uh, not to be um, just designated either um, Berehina figures or uh, just mother figures or devoted wife figures on the second roles as uh, support characters for assertive masculine uh, just uh, heroes, uh, but women who have their subjectivity who understand themselves, uh, who explore themselves, uh, and they find uh, different routes of uh, exploration. And this is what I see in uh, uh, just Andruhovich and uh, Karpa. But this is already a different period. But I would definitely um, encourage uh, Ukrainian women writers to write about themselves uh, and to write um, about their bodies. And uh, this is something that has been uh, formulated a long time ago by uh, Elaine Sixou, who was saying just women should write about themselves and their bodies. And then Angela Carter, uh, who is an English author, um, she has been uh, termed uh, as uh, the high priestess of postgraduate porn. Uh, she was writing this exquisite pornography. Well, you know what kind of message I was uh, just getting and uh, what kind of, uh, uh, and this kind of message I found a kind of disturbing. Uh, well, uh, because uh, it's, uh, if not uh, explicitly misogynistic, it's like very either misogynistic or semi-misogynistic attitude towards women. Uh, women who are supposed to be, uh, and uh, uh, many of them are trapped in uh, stereotypes. The stereotypes about female sexuality, 
uh, which go back to uh, just Christianity and the idea of a woman as a kind of just this uh, uh, terrible, voracious creature who is causing man's downfall with her unbridled sexuality and so on and so forth. So a woman who is sexually insatiable and uh, a woman who is uh, always available for male consumer. Um, so this is, uh, and especially in the Kapranov brothers, where men uh, um, have multiple affairs, they have multiple lovers, they are unfaithful to their wives, so their wives are just sitting and waiting until they come and then if they leave, their wives might commit suicide and so on and so forth. So it's a very, a very, I would say, archaic world. Uh, the world uh, where a, a man uh, uh, just considered was considered to be the head of the family and practically the driving force of uh, um, personal life and uh, society. Um, and uh, this is not something that is happening right now. And uh, I think that man should somehow step out of this uh, uh, just ready-made template and uh, stop uh, just looking at women as the objects of their desire, which they would like to satisfy in any moment, uh, demonstrating this like macho proclivity on their behalf. Uh, they should think about themselves, they should think about their bodies too, and they should think what they want. Although the book is on literature, in, in my introduction, I write about media, I write about uh, uh, just internet, I write about uh, just a survey of what is having uh, going on, visual art and uh, uh, film. Um, so this gives uh, a better idea and some of the social processes and connecting the interrupted tradition of Ukrainian modernist writers who started to explore uh, the body and sexuality, but uh, which was like net in the bud. Well, but if they are interested in the subject matter, please read my book. Thank you very much for having me. It has been a pleasure. And have a good day.